Okay, welcome back everyone. I hope everybody had a really good lunch and is energized for the afternoon session. Um, we're going to have, uh, I'm going to go until about 3.20 p.m. Uh, in the first part of this, and we'll take a 10 minute break there, and then we'll start in again about 3.30, and we'll go until 5, and then we'll come to our dinner break. So, let's pick up where we left off. I was talking about brain structure and human behavior, and how these two things are completely interrelated. <clears throat> brain health plays a critical role in human behavior, so it is extremely important for human beings to become familiar with the brain's basic structure and function. Now, <clears throat> I'm not telling you that this is the totality of neuroscience, what I'm going to show you here today. I'm saying that this is the basics. It's the essence of how the brain structure works. So this is part of understanding the physiological uh, aspects of how consciousness works, all right? So there's three main complexes, structures, that comprise the, the total human brain. The first is the R complex or the reptilian brain. So this part of the brain facilitates <clears throat> basic survival functions. It's the part of the brain that goes to work and becomes active when we're in what's called fight or flight mode, okay? Uh, when survival is at stake. It also controls basic motor functions and, and respiration, okay? The second part of the brain is above the R complex. This is called the limbic system. It's also known as the mammal brain, the mammalian brain. This part of the brain facilitates human emotions and it makes um, human emotion possible to be felt in the physiology. It does this by releasing what's known as neuropeptides into the bloodstream through different, different glands that comprise the, the limbic brain or what's called the midbrain also. So uh, the final part of the brain, the, the highest structure uh, structurally, and the newest part of the brain uh, evolutionarily, it's called the neocortex. Now really what this part of the brain is really called is the telencephalon. That's what we traditionally think of as the gray matter of the brain, okay, uh, with the hemispheres, okay. Uh, the neocortex is where all of the actual uh, electrochemical activity that comprises our human modes of thought takes place, and that's in the outer shell of the telencephalon, which is known as the neocortex. So this part of the brain actually facilitates all human functions of thought, what we consider the things in thought that make us a human being and separate us from the animal kingdom. Higher thought functions, logic, um, uh, intuition, creativity, okay? So we'll, we'll break down these parts of the brain and uh, give you some visual understanding of them. So down here, <clears throat> which, sorry. Down here is the reptilian brain. It's comprised of the brain stem right here, and this part of the brain is called the, um, the uh, cerebellum, okay? These two components together essentially comprise the R complex. So again, the R complex is the lowest consciousness part of the brain. We don't do any thinking with this part of the brain. It's the reactive part of the brain. It reacts to stimulus. It's the stimulus response mechanism. Now up here, in this middle part of the brain, these are all the different glands like the hypothalamus, the thalamus, the uh, pituitary and pineal glands, etc., that comprise the, the midbrain or the limbic system. All human emotions are facilitated, are made possible by this part of the brain, okay? So um, this part of the brain, if it wasn't working properly, you would not be able to experience a normal range of human emotions. This is part of what psychopathy is. Psychopaths, this part of the brain is not functioning properly, whether it be from a birth disorder or whether it be from um, conditions over one's life that if someone has stayed in chronically has numbed out this part of the brain and it is not, is not functioning properly anymore so the person's not actually experiencing a normal range of emotions. This part of the brain, which again is the telencephalon, this gray uh, matter part with all of the grooves, etc. Um, <clears throat> that's the neocortex. The neocortex is the outer 
casing, basically, of the telencephalon, the higher brain. It's the human brain, okay? Neo means new, so it's the newest part of the brain structure uh, as far as uh, evolutionary development of the human being goes. So this part of the brain facilitates all higher order thinking. Now, if what you have to understand about the, the telencephalon or the hemispheres of the brain is that they're, they're, first of all, bilaterally symmetrical and they generally control different functions of thought. Now, I'm not telling you it's 100%. Neuroscience is more complicated than that, okay? But in general, the left part, the left hemisphere of the brain is uh, what governs logic, analytical thought, and scientific and mathematical thinking, and also linear thought processes, okay? Physical world tasks and details, being able to break things down and analyze them, all right? So this is taking things apart, breaking them down into smaller components, and analyzing the pieces. That's what the left brain does. You could look at it as, you could look at it as a series processor, okay? It has to go into this part first, then here, and then here, and then we can spit out the output. A linear process, like a series processor, okay? The right side of the brain, the right hemisphere, uh, governs or generally facilitates and makes possible human creativity, our emotional makeup, okay, all the emotional dynamics of the human being, holistic thought, being able to see the big picture, big picture thinking, pattern recognition, and then things like compassion, nurturing, care, okay, um, ethics to a large extent. And I don't say ethical thinking comes from a, a balance between the two, as we're going to get into. Now, if this left part of the brain here becomes chronically dominant, the masculine part of the brain, and again, I'm putting these symbols here. This is an ancient uh, archetypal symbol called the blade. It's a simple upward-pointing triangle. And this downward-pointing triangle is an, another ancient archetypal symbol that is, was referred to in the ancient world as the chalice, the cup, etc. Okay, and you know, this was a rudimentary phallic symbol, and this was a rudimentary womb symbol representing the male and the female, or the masculine and feminine, more accurately, components of the consciousness. The idea is to keep a balance between these two. When we have a balance between the two, that's when we're operating on all cylinders, so to speak. That's when real consciousness and pattern recognition is developed. And that's when real morality and ethical considerations are also created within the personality, within the being. If this part of the brain is chronically dominant, the left part of the brain, okay, what happens is the, the right side of the brain is, is imbalanced. It's not really functioning uh, at a higher level, okay? And the, the limbic brain will actually suffer that effect, okay? It will also start to shut down. So you will have a lot of left brain patterns going on and a lot of left brain processing going on. But if that's all that's happening and we're not using this part of the brain it, it, equally, the R complex of the brain is what essential um, executive functions are going to be routed to. We're going to be living from the R complex in a kind of stimulus response only mode instead of living from a holistic uh, brain balanced mode, uh, which, which is when, when we're in that balanced state, the neocortex, which governs higher order thinking and makes higher order thinking and ethical thinking possible, is what rules the personality, okay? Now, conversely, if the right side of the brain is chronically dominant, so let's put it this way. The left side of the brain being chronically dominant, you have the controller. That's the, ma that's the master mentality. The, the right side of the brain being chronically dominant, that's the slave mentality. That's the I won't stand up for myself and I'll just accept everything the total new ager, in other words, okay? So this part of the brain, if it's chronically dominant, the opposite happens with the structures of the brain. The R complex will shut down. It will suffer, okay? It will not work properly, which the R complex is necessary. It makes you stand up for yourself when you're under attack. Again, it's the fight-flight response. In a dangerous situation, you've got to know whether you're going to fight whatever is attacking you or whether you're going to get out of dodge and run away. Okay, that's a survival mechanism that's necessary when there's danger. So uh, when this part of the brain is chronically imbalanced, the R complex gets shut down, 
people freeze essentially and they don't stand up for themselves and take action, what they're being, what's happening is they're being ruled by their emotions. And again, the, the limbic brain governs all emotions, positive and negative. So that's compassion and that's fear. It's any possible human emotion. The, the, the midbrain is what's ultimately facilitating that emotion in the physiology. All right? So if this part of the brain is chronically dominant, the opposite happens. You go into slave think, you shut down, you freeze, you're ru ruled by the emotions, and you don't stand up for yourself. So the neocortex of the brain has two hemispheres. The left brain largely facilitates logic and scientific thought, while the right brain hemisphere largely facilitates creativity and compassion. When both hemispheres are in balance, the neocortex acts in its proper role as the executive command center of the whole human brain. And that's when true intelligence is born. Now, true intelligence is a concept that I think more people really have to understand. People have equated intelligence with intellect, especially in the Western society, all right? Intellect is not intelligence. Let me say that again. Intellect is not intelligence. Intelligence comprises more than intellect. Intellect is left brain understanding. True intelligence is holistic understanding with the right brain included in the process, the nurturing, compassionate, creative, and intuitive sides of the consciousness together with the intellectual aspect of the consciousness. And you can see this in the word. Intelligence, right? Intella is where intellect comes from, okay? And gens, G-E-N-C-E, -E, comes from the Latin verb genere. Genere means to generate or to create. So it's the creative aspect of the personality or the right brain. So intellect plus creativity, logical thinking plus nurturing and compassion, that's real intelligence, holistic intelligence. And most people in our society are not in holistic intelligence. They're in one form of brain imbalance or the other. So let's look at how this manifests. If a human brain's left brain hemisphere becomes chronically dominant, the R complex will take over executive function of the brain and the person will become ruled by selfishness and base desires. And they will develop a personality that is based in domination and control. Conversely, if a human being's right brain hemisphere becomes chronically dominant, the limbic system will take over executive function of the whole brain, and the person will become ruled by their own emotions and develop a personality that is based in submissiveness and naivete. Okay? The, the slave think mentality. The schism of the individual. Okay? And this is critical. Because this is not only a schism within the, the individual consciousness, it's a schism of worldview, of the way we view ourselves in the world and the way we view our relationship to others in the world. So I call this the mental schism. And it highlights basically what will happen, what kinds of thinking will, will manifest when certain types of brain imbalance are present. So when we're in this schism, and again, most of humanity is, if we're, too, we're overly intellectualizing everything and we're too much in the masculine hemisphere of the brain, okay, we're not using the right or intuitive capacities of the brain, the right uh, brain hemisphere. What this can lead to in the world is, again, rigid skepticism. Now, what did we say about that? It's not conducive to learning. People aren't really going to learn when they're rigidly skeptical. This is a hallmark of scientism. Scientismists, I don't know what other thing to call it, uh, worshipers of the altar of scientism, okay? They are, they have this rigid skepticism because they're purely intellectual. They're not really intelligent. The, the creative aspect is missing from their personality makeup, okay? Um, atheism is a hallmark of overly dominant left brain thinking because that, you know, shuns all aspects of spiritual reality. There is no spirit. The universe is a grand cosmic accident. You know, from there you get things like solipsism. People will say, well, isn't solipsism purely left brain? No. 
It is right, it is right brain, I'm sorry, is it, is it purely right brain? And I say no, it is left brain imbalance as well. Solipsism can be generated from both forms of imbalance, of believing nothing can actually be known. There is no truth. The, you know, truth is a dirty word to many left brain individuals. You'll know, you'll know, you know? So solipsism plays into left brain imbalance as well. All of these states here inevitably lead to these things down here. Moral relativism comes next. The idea that there's no such thing as the difference between right and wrong. That we just get to make those things up. They don't exist inherently in nature. You know, We just can decide on what's right and what's wrong for ourselves and make it up you know, randomly. So very, very dangerous ideology which we're going to be talking about a lot. Social Darwinism inevitably comes after that. All right? This is the idea that a certain class of society can get to direct how the lives of everybody else will go uh, because they're the intelligentsia, so-called, okay, or the intellectual people, really is what, the, what it is, uh, the over-intellectualizing, and um, we'll direct society because we're the fittest. Like Darwinism postulates the survival of the fittest, well, social Darwinism postulates the survival of the most socially ruthless. And many people believe that's the natural order. They believe that's the natural order, and nothing could be farther from the truth. What that is, is it's the psychopathic chaos. It has nothing to do with nature, and it has nothing to do with order. It's the exact opposite. So, this state, and, and these are hallmarks of dark occultism as well. Okay? I think I should know a thing or two about it, as I was a priest in it for almost 10 years. I might know a couple of things about Satanism. Okay, so moral relativism is one of the big tenets of Satanism. It's actually one of the pillars of Satanism. Social Darwinism is highly praised and valued in Satanism, and eugenics. Okay, because it's, if people don't understand what eugenics is, eugenics is basically people, you know, who have gone so deep into this form of left brain imbalance that they believe they're God and they can get to decide who lives and who dies. That's really what it is. We will control who breeds and who does not get to breed, who gets to live and who does not get to live. All right? That's essentially eugenics in a nutshell. And again, these are all authoritarianism, forms of authoritarianism. Okay? Um, and it's the idea that man is the author. Man is the creator. Man is the God. Man will make the law. Man will decide, who, you know, life and death at any given moment. We will decide what's right and wrong, etc. That's, that's essentially what all of these forms of thought are extreme left-brained imbalance. And I was there. I was in this state in my life. I was in it for years, for years, all right? Um, let's look at the other form of imbalance. Uh, if the right side of the brain is chronically dominant, this leads to, you know, similar kind of imbalance, but in the exact opposite form. Okay? The, the brain is still completely imbalanced, therefore the person's not in a high state of consciousness. They're completely unconscious to what's really going on within them and around them. But the manifestation is generally the opposite of the left brain forms of imbalance. So if you're in real right brain imbalanced state of consciousness, this will lead to naivete, believing anything you're told, accepting things from quote unquote official channels and official sources without actually checking into them for yourself. Blind belief. You'll believe the, ne the next uh, religion that comes along. You know, we just have to tell them what they want to hear, and oh, I'll believe that. You know, so, you know, New Agers are basically in this category, naivete and blind belief. People who trust government, of course, are in that category, because again, it's about creating the masters and the slaves. That's, that's what brain imbalance is for. And th that's why the controllers want to propagate this imbalance and, and keep it in place. Again, religious extremism, that's hallmarks of right brain belief. Right brain imbalance. Solipsism, no such thing as truth. You know, all from right brain imbalance as well. Feelings of unworthiness, self-loathing, accepting orders from other people, being an order follower. We're going to have a whole section on order followers later and how this is the exact opposite of anything virtuous. For people that believe order following is some kind of a virtue, you know, I, I don't know what to tell you but it's, it's the thing that leads to all evil in the world. 
is accepting somebody's orders and not actually gauging for yourself whether the activity, the, the behavior is moral or not. Okay? And it, it, it creates a willing slave. This, this form of imbalance is ultimately generating a willing slave, whereas this form of imbalance is ultimately generating a psychopathic master. And they're all forms of mind control. It's just, it's just another aspect of how mind control works. The, the propagators of mind control are just doing this to keep that imbalance present in one form or another. They don't even care which it is. As long as they have some that are imbalanced toward one direction and some imbalanced toward the other direction, that's how the dynamic plays off against itself. And you have a world that is continued to be kept under lockdown. So let's look at the worldview schism that goes hand in hand with the brain schism or the mental schism. And th again, this is worldview is exactly what it says. How do you view the world? How do you view yourself in it? How do you view others in it? Well, when there's chronic left brain dominance, the worldview that emerges is one of randomness. And again, this is a hallmark of scientism. The world is this grand cosmic accident. All right? The whole universe is a grand accident. There's no purpose. All right? It, there's no creator. Everything just ma magically manifested on its own for no reason from a single, a single singularity, a single point in space-time for no reason. You give me that one, and I'll tell you what ha everything else that happened after that. But you got to give me that one, you know? And I have some bridges to sell you, you know? So, you know, there's, a, there's no underlying intelligence in nature. Nature is dead. That's what this worldview is about. Nature is dead. It's a dead thing. It's a mechanized machine that is there for no reason, okay? There's no such thing as the spirit at all. No such thing as spiritual dimension. No such thing as natural law, certainly. Because for, for one to accept natural law, well, where does it come from? You know, I, I ask people like whether they accept that natural law exists or that, you know, there's actual objective truth and morality. And like two-thirds of people don't believe don't accept it. They don't believe that it exists. They don't think there is objective reality and objective truth and objective morality. You know, they think it's all relative and we get to make it up. I've actually done a, a psychological a uh, small psychological profiling or study, you know, uh, just asking people this question at random and collecting results and analyzing them. We're at about two-thirds of people who are moral relativists and believe that truth is relative also, that it's not objective, okay? Now, you ask the same people, do you believe in karma? 88, almost 90% of people believe karma is real and it exists, so I, I, I'm like, I can't believe this. You, you're going to tell me that there's no such thing as a difference, real difference between right and wrong. Human, they're constructs in the human mind is what they think, right? And simultaneously holding in their mind the idea that karma exists. Well, I, I asked them the question, what put karma in place then? You believe it exists. What force created it? What made it? What put it in place? And they have no answer for that. You know, they intuitively believe karma exists, but can't answer where did it come from, because that would involve a creator, and somebody in left brain imbalance can't acknowledge that. You know, so to a left brain imbalanced person, there's no such thing as spiritual or natural law; it doesn't exist. Uh, as a matter of fact, all of existence has no purpose other than to continue its existence. See, survival is the highest aspiration to a left brain imbalanced individual. Right and wrong have no bearing. There's, there's no point in even discussing it, okay? Because right's what's right for me if I'm super left brain imbalanced. Wrong is whatever affects me negatively, okay? It doesn't matter what's actually moral, okay? It's all subjective to a left brain imbalanced individual. And to them, nothing has any purpose. Since it's all a grand cosmic accident, how could there be a purpose for existence? Without a creator, who's going to create the purpose for it, you know? So it has no purpose other than to continue surviving. And again, that's right there is proof they're in the R complex, they're in the base brain. Survival is the highest goal. Survival is the only aspiration. Now, in Satanism, it's about as left brain imbalanced as it gets, folks. You know what their number one law is? Survival. Survival is the highest law, 
Okay, and we hear about this in Darwinism too. The ultimate purpose of the being is to continue to survive. I would highly debate that. I would highly disagree with that. There, is, there are laws higher than survival. Okay? But in Satanism, they simply refer to it as self-preservation. And that means preservation of systems of belief as well. Systems that are serving the self, the egoic self, they must continue to survive. Self-preservation as the highest law. That's, what's, that's the number one tenet of Satanism. And it doesn't matter who you need to step on to do it. Who you need to step on to get one up on somebody else. This is extreme left brain imbalance worldview. All of these characteristics in the randomness worldview are hallmarks of scientism, atheism, totalitarianism, and dark occultism. You could add to that list. You know, whether you refer to it as Satanism, dark Luciferianism, it doesn't make a difference. It's the hallmarks of the dark occult. On the other side, on the right brain imbalanced side of the worldview, there's another worldview called determinism. Okay, determinism is based in right brain imbalance and is defined by, in general, helplessness, religiosity, and the dismissal of free will. This worldview will eventually lead to a society of blind order followers and willing slaves who accept their conditions as their lot in life. So, hallmarks of deterministic worldview. God controls every event in creation. Nothing happens at random. There is no free will. So, so you can never throw anything a curveball through free will. Every event is preordained. Okay, And re religionists believe in this. See, I, I like to say, my presentation is going to piss everybody off. And that's what it should do. Because if, if you're in one of these forms of belief systems, it's, it represents one form of imbalance or another. So people who believe in government and science are in that left brain imbalance. They're going to get pissed off that I'm talking about that form of imbalance. And then the people who are in religion and the New Age movement, they're in that right form of imbalance, so they're going to get pissed off at that. Good. Let them all be pissed off. <laughs> The truth will piss you off and then it will set you free if you accept it. So, you know, all occurrences are preordained. Free will is an illusion. Now, you know who just said this in his latest book? Stephen Hawking, who you would think is the most left brain person that you could think worships at the altar of scientism, believes the universe is a grand accident, okay, and a mechanized machine, okay. He, it's like, it's like this comes full circle. It feeds off of each other like a feedback loop, these forms of imbalance. He went so far through left brain imbalance, he's so in the left brain, that he actually developed the hallmark of right brain imbalance, which is that there's no such thing as free will. No such thing. Since it's all a mechanized machine, and there's no consciousness, there can actually be no choice. We are actually robots controlled by matter. Hawking believes this. He actually wrote this in his book. He said, free will is as dead as God. Okay? And pe millions of people buy this moron's books, and I'll call him a moron right to his face. There's not a drop of intelligence in that man, and people think he's one of the most intelligent people in the world. You might be one of the most overly intellectual people in the world, but you have no wisdom at all. Zero, if that's how you think. And again, put him in front of me, and I'll tell it to him to his face. Okay? Because these pe people actually believe he's smart. That person isn't smart. He's dumb. He's intellectual, but that doesn't make you intelligent. Okay? He has no part of the big picture. None. Just because you can theorize something and, and visualize it and calculate it mathematically does not make you an intelligent person. That means you're great at using the intellect. You're great at mathematics. You're great at linear and logical thinking. That does not make you wise. All right? So, you know, this uh, to, to continue with the right-brained, imbalanced worldview, since God controls everything in creation, nothing is possible to change. Human beings are powerless to create change. Everything is being made to be this way by God. This is what religionists and right brain imbalanced people think. So, therefore, why take any action? Action is ultimately meaningless. A big hallmark of the New Age community, because it's a religion. You know, the Course in Miracles. Oh, we just need to accept everything the way that it is, right, folks? 
doesn't make a difference if evil is running amok in our midst. No. Accept it all. Don't try to change a damn thing. Take no action. Just observe. And see how far deeper that gets you into bondage. Because that's the best way to get real deeper into chains. Okay? So these are all hallmarks of religious extremism and what I call simply slave think, because that's what it is. Let's not euphemize anything. Let's call them what it really is. This is master think, that's slave think. And if you want a world that continues to propagate slavery, you'll stay in one of those forms of brain imbalance. And this right brain imbalance, in, in addition to religious extremism and slave think, is the hallmark of the New Age movement and their followers, their religious followers. Now, there's a balance that is struck between these, okay? And that's what everything really is ultimately about, creating a balance. Because there are components to these two worldviews that if they come together, it shows, it shows us what the truth is. And here it is right in the middle here. There is a deterministic component to reality. And there is a random component to reality existing in cooperation with each other, in conjunction with each other. The deterministic component is what I'm talking about here today and referring to under the banner of natural law. That is determined. It is law. It is set. You're not changing it. It works that way flawlessly 100% of the time. That's determined. Natural law is determined. Okay? It's the deterministic component to reality. Then there is a randomness component to reality that works continuously in conjunction with natural law. And this is called, this is a little thing called free will. Our ability to choose our behaviors, to do certain things and to not choose to do certain things. And we have it. Every individual has it, no matter what position, no matter what situation they're in. I don't care what institution you're in. I don't care what who you've listened to up to this point. I don't care what background you come from. I don't care what economic class you come from. Every single solitary being that is capable of thinking at all is gifted with free will. You have free will to choose your behaviors, and so does every other human being. Everyone. Okay? It's a gift of creation itself. Okay, we can choose what we will do and not do. Nobody can actually make anybody do something like a robot. Oh, believe me, there's people who are trying. You know? Like Art talked about, Jose Delgado was searching for means to electronically, directly control through chip implants and stimulus through chip implants in the brain, human behavior, like a robot, to put a technology into the brain to control the behavior of the individual. And that went on right here. This is where that took place, folks, right on Yale's campus, okay? Read, read some of his stuff. You want to be disturbed? You think what I'm telling you is somewhat disturbing. Read some of Delgado's material. He was telling people, we're going to show you that free will doesn't exist. We're going to show you there's no such thing as rights. That we make up what rights are. The ruling class makes up what a right or, and a wrong is. We tell you what it is and you have no choice. And he was telling you, we're going to show you you have no rights. That you're our slaves. Yeah, read some of his material. And an excellent book Art recommended too, uh, uh, Jim Keith, Mass, Con uh, Mass Control, The Engineering of Human Consciousness. If you haven't read that book, get it and read it. And that's just an introduction. And many people think he was murdered over it. You know, so uh, truth lies in the middle of these worldviews. There's a deterministic component called natural law. There's a random component called free will, our ability to choose our behavior freely. So let's look at this debate that's been going on since time immemorial of human nature versus human nurture. And again, I'm getting ready to piss everybody off, okay? Um, this debate's been going on forever. Wh which is it? What's human nature really look like? What's its, what's its essence? Is it angelic or demonic? Okay? I would say it's neither. It's neither one of these things. It's not, it's not both. It's neither. So nobody wins here, you know, who, who falls on one side or the other. 
And it's a very difficult thing for people to accept as well. Because when we ask the question, what is the nature of a human being? It's a very similar question to asking, what is the nature of this computer up on this platform? What is the nature of that projector? What is the nature of those cameras? Well, is there, can I actually say what a nature, what the nature of these things is? It's a computer. Its nature is to compute information. What is the nature of that projector? Is it good, is it bad, is it angelic, is it demonic? Is that projector demonic? No, its nature is that it projects imagery. What is the nature of these cameras? They capture imagery, that's all. So what's the nature of a human being? The nature of a human being is that it takes in information, it processes it, and then it outputs it through behavior. And as we're gonna see, that's very much like a computer. I'm not saying that it is a computer, I'm saying it's like one, okay? So human nature is neither inherently good nor inherently evil, as many people think fall on one side of this argument or the other. Instead, we should consider the operating conditions or the environment in which human beings exist, which influence, influences behavior to a great extent, thus creating the current human condition. That's why it's called the human condition. It's not called, the situation we're in is called the human condition. It's not called the human nature, okay? It's called the human condition. There's a reason it's called a condition. For any condition to be in place, well, hey, what condition is my computer in right now? What condition is my projector in? What position is Richard's cameras in? They're in operating conditions. They're doing what they're supposed to be doing because they've been kept up in good condition. Okay, in the example of my computer, it has a working operating system without malware on it. Okay, it has software that does the job, that does what I'm asking it to do properly without bugs. Okay, those are the conditions. The operating conditions will determine how does it perform? What kind of output can it put out into the world? All right, so again, what I'm saying here is that human beings are like computers, not that they are computers. Let me just state that emphatically. We're not computers, we're like computers, okay? We are programmable. That's the nature of a human being. How many people have ever heard anybody say that the nature of a human being is that a human being is programmable? Uh, to my knowledge, I'm the only person or researcher that is calling that human nature. Our nature is that we can be programmed. And pe there's another thing, that's another thing people don't want to hear. They don't want to hear this. Because, it, they, again, they liken it to a mechanized machine. And I'm not saying, again, uh, to emphasize, I'm not saying we are computers. I'm saying we're like them in the ways that we can be programmed. So what gets put into a person through the environment, which is called the culture, all right, and becomes their programming, determines what they will output onto the screen, which is called human life, and that will create the human condition in the aggregate as more and more people operate that way, all right? So let's look at how this works. Human beings are programmable much like computers. Like a computer, if a human being has a bad file system format, that's the first thing you do when you're gonna get ready to use a computer. You have to format the drive. How many people here are somewhat techy? Not many, okay, about a quarter to a third, all right. So some people will know what I'm talking about here. For the others, excuse the jargon for a moment, all right? I'll explain what it is. A file system format is you gotta format the hard drive so you can prepare it for a specific operating system which is basically the task controllers. It's gonna control what happens on the computer, what prog how programs get launched, how memory is used, et cetera, in a nutshell, all right? I, I do this for a living, so you know, I know all the technical stuff. I'll, I'll, so I'll try to keep it simple. So if the human being has a fed, bad file system format, right? this is akin to the operating conditions during a child's formative years the first six years of their life, essentially. Now, think about it. We call this their formative years, their formative years, 
like a format on a hard drive, because this is what puts the file system into the human being, that prepares it for its operating system. Okay, so largely what programs the child at this stage is the parents, and what they will see in their immediate environment at home and during their very early years in, quote, schooling. All right? Now, if, like a computer, if a human being also has bad, a bad operating system, now this is like Mac OS, Windows, Linux, uh, ex, uh, you know, et cetera, uh, Android, iOS, these are operating systems. Again, they are basically providing a platform that other programs will run in, and they're providing a graphical user interface. This is your culture. The operating system is the culture in which the programs run, okay? So let's say if you have a bad operating system, meaning you're already surrounded in a bad environment, in a bad culture, right? That's also going to negatively impact the output. And then they have bad software programs. Now, these are the programs that you run. Now, if I didn't have a good presentation uh, software, piece of software, my presentation might come out sloppy. It might crash in the middle of it. It, it might not display the graphics or the text properly. Okay? So you've got to make sure you're working with good, reliable software as well. Now, what the software is, is the belief systems. What the person has taken into the mind and is processed and made part of themselves. And th now, if all of those things are bad, we have three bad components. The format is bad, the file system format, which is the formative years of the child, okay? The culture is bad, meaning they're already growing up in a bad culture or in a con culture that condones moral relativism, et cetera, and doesn't understand natural law. And the software programs that have been input into the child are bad, meaning their belief systems, okay? What do you think the output of that, quote, computer is going to be like? Is it going to be good? Is it going to be chaotic? If I screw up my system's hard drive format, if I put an operating system that is like at alpha state and it's not ready for prime time because the development's not finished, it's half-baked, okay? And then I load crappy software that's full of bugs and the developers didn't really care about programming them correctly. Do you think that computer is going to operate properly and give me the output on the screen I'm looking for or output on the printout I'm looking for or output on the internet that I'm looking for? Good luck. <laughs> if you know a little bit about computers, you're, you're laughing now because it would be ridiculous to assume that it could do that. Well, why do we think that we're going to have that in our environment when all of these things are badly programmed? See, the output onto the screen is also going to be horrible if all those three things you know, that determine how the, the, the system works are also bad. So it will continue, it will contribute to deteriorating conditions on a mass scale. Like a computer, the behavior of a human being largely depends upon its programming. And its programming is the quality of the information that is being input into it. The quality of the information it's taking in. The quality of the information it's taking in is going to determine the quality of the information it's outputting, like any other computer. So if garbage goes in, surprise, garbage is going to come out. If good information goes in, quality goes in, quality will come out, and the output will be as one wants it to be. It will be able to process and create efficiently, effectively, not chaotically. Here's a very simple diagram. Again, if people understand it, they really get how natural law functions. And again, it's very unpopular. People don't want to look at what the bottom base foundation or platform of this structure is. Because once again, this idea that knowledge is what's required makes many people upset because they want to believe they're going to achieve these things they say they want without doing the work to acquire that knowledge and therefore understand the requirements for obtaining those conditions. So we start with available information. And for when people look at what I'm going to describe here, they will recognize it as something. Uh, and I'll hold what that is for a moment. Available information is what you're starting with. This constitutes potential knowledge, and it can become knowledge if it's taken in, if it's amassed, if it's aggregated, 
okay? It can be gathered, it can be processed, it can be understood, and then it can be acted upon. We're st- you could call this the grammar stage of this p- three-part process I'm going to explain. Okay? You could also refer to this as the input stage. If we're looking at it in a computer model, this is the stage of inputting information or programming something. Okay. Now the next step that's built upon this is once you've taken information in, necessary information, you then come to a position of understanding it. You know what it means, you recognize the patterns. All right. So this is the second step in this process. Now, the, your understanding or lack of understanding, okay, now in the first stage, your knowledge or lack of knowledge is going to lead to understanding or lack of understanding. If you have understanding present, your decision-making processes are going to be in harmony with what you say you want, okay? You're going to understand, if here's what I want, this is what's necessary to get that, to make that happen, to manifest it. That's understanding. It's a decision-making process that happens within the mind. These processes take place in the human mind and are chosen by each individual based upon available information. So again, you can see, if information is held back, if it is occulted, or even if it's just people are dissuaded from taking it in, because people will say, no, there's nothing there, there's nothing to it, right? You could see how they'll never get to this step. They'll never understand. They'll never get to the, the, the second level of creating our reality, all right? Effectively, efficiently. The third stage to this process is what you do with what you have come to understand, to know and understand. So this is the action stage, okay? Each individual's behavior, the behaviors that they choose through their own free will, is based upon the quality of their decision-making processes that are happening within the human mind, okay? That process, as we've already seen, is in return based upon the quality of available information, So this is behavior. See, people don't think of wisdom as behavior. They don't think of wisdom as action. They think of it as something that you just know. No, wrong. Wisdom is not knowledge or understanding. Wisdom is action. Let me say this again. Wisdom is action. It is knowledge and understanding that has been applied. Application. That's the program that you're going to run on the computer that you've put an operating system on and formatted properly. The application is the action. When you're working in a computer doing things, you're working in an application. You're not building the things you're building with the operating system. The operating system is what's supporting the program that allows you to be creative, okay? And in return, the file format supports the operating system. So, we start with available knowledge. That can be converted in uh, available information, which can be converted into knowledge, which can then, through decision-making processes and filtering of that information to eliminate inconsistencies, can lead to an understanding. In in, in, uh, continuation... The understanding can then lead through our free will decision-making processes to be converted into behavior, into action in the world. That, when it's done properly, it's wisdom. When it's done with morality and ethics in mind, it's wisdom. When it's done without that, it's folly. Okay, And it leads to more and more chaos. So b- based upon these three processes, something is generated. Something is created in the physical manifestation, physically manifested reality, the real world, so to speak. So the manifested reality is based upon the aggregate behavior. Aggregate behavior. No one person is creating the reality we are experiencing. Okay, It's another fallacy of the New Age movement and thinking. In the aggregate, we are creating our shared reality. All the behaviors put together creates the output on the screen, the generated result. Is it orderly? Is it chaotic? Well, that's going to be based upon whether someone took in the information, processed it efficiently to come to an understanding, and then acted upon it. 
The manifested reality is the quality of the condition which manifests in any given society based upon the aggregate quality of human behavior within that society. This is how our reality is actually created. The conditions that we experience as the daily events of our life, it's a simple three-stage process that leads to a result. And for many people here, you will recognize if you've looked into this discovery process and this creative process is known as the trivium. This is what the trivium is. Okay, In the ancient uh, traditions, this is what the trivium was labeled. It was labeled knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. In the later aspects, when they passed out of mystery school tradition hands and went into some other think tank and society hands, the, the knowledge of the trivium was termed grammar, logic, and rhetoric. Grammar being the knowledge stage of aggregating available information, logic being the understanding stage of making a, uh, using uh, processes to analyze and, and filter uh, said information and come to an understanding of it. And then the rhetoric stage was the application the action, taking action based upon what you've come to understand. Now, there's a third way of looking at the trivium in computer jargon, and that is input, processing, and output. And then you get the result on the screen, which is called life. All right? Any way you want to look at the trivium, I don't care. But understand it, know how it works. Okay, because this is why we're a big part of why we're in the situation that we're in is that the trivium methodology of truth discovery has been completely obliterated from public consciousness. Completely obliterated. And I ask people how many people have even ever heard the word trivium. Raise your hand if you've heard heard the word. So a good portion of the people here have. Many people have never heard the word. And if you do a Google search on it, most people are going to get back the band, the metal band, the Trivium, which is not a bad band, but, you know, but the, the whole point here is we'd ra the results that are going to come back through Google or Bing or, or Yahoo or whatever are going to give you a metal band, a heavy metal band, instead of the Trivium method of learning, the classical liberal arts education methodology, because they want to try to sanitize that as much from human consumption as possible. They don't even want you to understand how that works at all. And that's why it's been removed from public schooling. And that's why, as long as this society stays the way it is, it'll never be put back into public schooling. You know, I tell people a little anecdote. It, uh, when I was in, when I was in uh, high school, and thank God I went to the high school I did because they really hammered Latin and Greek into you. You were going to know your Latin and Greek when you came out of my high school, okay? For whatever other indoctrination they put into you, that's a different story. But I'll tell you what, you came out of there knowing your ancient languages, they, they, you know, it was still part of the curriculum when I was in high school. And, uh, you know, again, uh, I, I think I came out better out of there because of simply the linguistics knowledge that I gained from it. And uh, we read uh, Gaius Julius Caesar's war journals in their original Latin and translated them. And in one of them, he's talking about, he's absolutely lambasting one of his... Um, centurions. Okay, they're on a campaign in Gaul, which is France now. And Caesar is, you know, making his rounds of his troops and they're getting ready to, you know, push deeper into Gaul. And he finds, you know, when, when they would have their encampments, they would have a lot of, uh, you know, slaves of the Roman Empire that they would take with them on their campaigns that would do a lot of the, the lifting of the equipment and the carrying of the equipment for the centurions to do battle in the next battlefield location, and uh, the slaves would have to do all that manual labor. And uh, Caesar says to one of his centurions, he's passing by their encampment, and he sees one of the actual centurion leaders teaching one of the slaves the trivium method. And he flips out on him in this journal. He says, I caught one of my centurions, you know, teaching the trivium, and freaks out on him. How dare you teach a slave our method of learning? Soon they won't want to be a slave anymore. There'd be an uprising if they knew what we knew, if they knew our truth discovery methodology. 
He said, but I think, I forget how it really ended, but I think how it ended was he told this centurion, if I ever catch you doing this again, I will personally throw you, cast you into the wilderness of Gaul and let the Gaulians deal with you. Who knew that the Roman Empire was trying to conquer their people at that point, which is basically saying it would be a death sentence, but I won't even carry it out. I'll let our enemy carry it out on you. That's how much he didn't want their slaves to understand their methodology for learning. And that's the trivium. And that's why most people have never heard the word. So you got to look into it and understand how it works. That's all I can say about it. It is how we build our reality, either efficiently or destructively. So let's look at some of the principles of natural law. Now, in my extended seminar, which goes over a six-week uh, class of of uh, lessons, um, I get into these principles deeply in, in, you know, in an extended form. We're not going to do that today because time doesn't allow. I'm going to briefly touch on each one. Okay? The word principles, let's define it. Principle comes from the Latin noun principia. Principia means first, foremost, leading, chief, or most necessary. It is that which matters most it is the first things that must be understood before anything else can be understood. Principles have to come first. And this is the problem. Our society does not put principles first. It puts trivialities first, and we're no longer a society that even cares about principles or first things. So first things first. First things or principles have to come first. So let's look at what the principles that underlie natural law. These are the things that are most important. That's what principles should mean to people. If we ask people to find what a principle is, the first thing they should say, that's the most important thing. The most important thing in my life. Now, when in, in the natural law seminar, we did a homework assignment. We asked people what the most important thing was to them. Very few responded with principles. Most people responded with saying that people where the family was the number one response. The familial connection was more important to them than principles. Now, when people hear me say that that's backwards, they'll say, how cold are you? That's so cold, okay? What I'm telling you is that the familial connection, no matter what it is, between a mother and a son, a mother and a daughter, a father and a son, father and a daughter, husband and wife, doesn't matter as much as principles. I'm not telling you they don't matter at all. I'm telling you, you have to put principles first. Otherwise, those relationships are just meaningless. They don't really have any real value unless they're based upon principles first, which is why so many relationships are dysfunctional. Principles have to come first before you can even build a solid relationship with another human being. So let's look at what some of the principles of how natural laws work first before we can actually find out what the expressions of these laws are in our lives, which will be the next section. These are what I call the general principles of natural law. Natural law is expressed through seven basic underlying principles, plus what I have referred to as an eighth or hidden principle, which you, t you hear very few other researchers, even people who are studying this from the occult perspective, who are studying this from the consequentialism perspective, you very hear them incorporate the eighth and all-encompassing principle, which I'll, I'll get to last here. This eighth principle, which I call the lost principle, binds all the other seven principles together. All right? These principles together constitute a master key through which universal wisdom including the knowledge of the requirements to obtaining what we desire, is then unveiled or de-occulted. When, when, when people ask me, well, what do you consider yourself in your performance of, of present, presenting what you present? I tell them, I consider myself a de-occultist. I'm no longer an occultist. I'm a de-occultist. I'm attempting to take this information out of hiding. It's been hidden. The hiding of it is destroying the fabric of our society and putting us into bondage. It needs to come out and be non-hidden. It needs to be unveiled and shared widely and freely with anybody who's capable of accepting it and comprehending it now. Because we're, in, we're not in a position where we could wait longer. We're, not in a, we're at the precipice. 
Okay? There is a, uh, a moral obligation to bring this information to the public now. Okay? So, I consider myself a deocultist. One who takes things out of hiding and presents them openly. These are the seven general principles of natural law. Many people who have studied some variants of occultism may recognize these as what are known as the hermetic principles. Hermetic essentially comes from Hermes. Hermes Tresmegistus, the, the, the thrice great one, as he was referred to in the ancient uh, Greek mystery traditions. Okay? He was uh, considered a messenger of the gods. He brought the wisdom of the gods down to humanity. Okay? In the ancient Egyptian and Kemetian tradition, traditions, he was the scribe of the gods known as Thoth. All right? He has other incarnations as well. But the hermetic tradition is named such because it's hermetically sealed, like natural law is. Natural law is hermetically sealed. It is binding principles that are immutable. They are laws that are in operation that cannot be changed. Hence, they are hermetically sealed. So, these pr seven general principles, they are mentalism, correspondence, vibration, polarity, rhythm, cause and effect, which is a huge one, which we'll be getting into, and gender. So I'm going to briefly describe what each of these are and what they are about. The principle of mentalism states that the all, everything in creation, is actually a manifestation of mind. The all is mind. Okay? What this means is everything that happens has to be a result of a mental state which preceded it. Everything. For anything to exist, thoughts had to form first, and then they formed the physical reality after. The universe itself is a mental construct of the Creator. Thoughts lead to the manifestation of things and events. Thoughts create conditions. Thoughts create things and conditions. They cannot just magically manifest themselves. Thought comes first. Thoughts create our state of existence and the quality of our experience here on earth, ultimately. Therefore, be responsible for everything. We should be responsible for everything that we create by being responsible for that which we think. Because the thought processes are what are driving the behaviors. People behave the way they do because they have certain belief systems embedded in the mind and running like a program. Their thoughts and their emotions are driving their actions. So the behavior is not magically suddenly going to just change. The thoughts and emotions have to change because they're the driving force behind the behavior. That's when reality will change. See, people don't want to hear that once again. They don't want to hear, if you want to change reality, you, yourself, have to change the way you think. Because the way you think is not conducive to the requirements for getting what you say you want. They're doing the exact opposite of that in many cases. So that's the principle of mentalism. The principle of correspondence states that that which is above is similar or like to that which is below. So what this means is that which is below, and that which is below is like to that which is above. It's a mirror, okay? The above is like the below, the below is like the above, all right? The above, in this case, is the macrocosm, okay? The, the laws of the very large things, okay? The laws that govern the creation, which we consider is seemingly outside of ourselves. We know, we know at the deepest level that it's not, that we're one with it, but... You know, we perceive this as out here, the laws that, that are, govern the, the large aspects of things. So the macrocosm were the very large, the totality of everything, and the microcosm, which is the very small, or the individuated units that comprise the whole in their aggregate, okay? They are reflections of each other. They cannot be separated from each other. As one goes, the other goes. The universe is actually a holographic system, okay? It's a hologram is an image, okay? You pass a, a laser through it, and it then projects a 3D image, okay? It's like a flat image, and it projects a three-dimensional image. But the 
aspect why they call it a hollow, like holistic hologram, holistic image, is if you break a hologram into multiple components by cutting it. So if I take a hologram and I cut it in four pieces, you don't have a quarter of the image on one part of the hologram and a quarter on the other and a quarter on the third and a quarter on the fourth. You have four whole images that only lose their resolution by a quarter. Okay? So everything is contained in all the smaller parts. Okay? That's the, like the reality that we're living in. Our universe is a holographic one. So the universe is inside the individual. And the entire universe is like an individual. They're reflections of each other. To know the workings of the individual will help lead us to an understanding of the macrocosmic laws. Similarly, to learn the macrocosmic laws will help us to learn the way that consciousness within the individual functions. These two things cannot be separated from each other. And once again, as I said at the, near the beginning, that's what occulted knowledge is. The knowledge of the occult is how the microcosmic world works, which is the individuated consciousness, and how the macrocosmic world works, which is natural law. So the other part of the principle of correspondence is that our reality is also fractal in nature. Now, if you studied fractals, these are self-similar mathematical generated patterns, okay? We see this through things like Fibonacci sequence in, in mathematics, and this is repeated endlessly throughout nature. Okay, so you look at, you look at the um, structure of the atom, and it's similar to the structure of the solar system, which is similar to the structure of the galaxy. They work the same way. They look the same. You pull back enough, you'll keep seeing the same pattern repeat. Everybody ever see the movie that was done in, I think, the 1970s or 80s? It's a short, like, 10-minute clip. It's called Powers of Ten. Has anybody ever seen this? Yes. A couple people. Watch this movie, Powers of Ten, and you'll understand what I'm talking about when I say that the universe is fractal in nature. Brilliant movie. It will blow your mind. Real short, 10 minutes long, something like 9 or 10 minutes long. They, they basically zoom up into the cosmos to show you how everything is self-similar. Then they zoom down into the cells of a human being and into the atoms that, that comprise the hand and, and cells of the hand and show you how everything is similar there, all the way down to the atomic level. Okay? And the subatomic level. So, uh, the universe is both holographic, meaning that the whole is contained in the parts and vice versa, and it is fractal or self-similar across all scales of its existence. That's the principle of correspondence. The principle of vibration simply states that there is no such thing as rest, as dead or, or non-motion. Okay? Death in that sense, is an illusion because true death would be the cessation of all motion and energy. There is no such thing. It doesn't exist. You cannot go anywhere in creation where something is com at complete rest. Okay? And I joke around about this. Barb tells me funny stories when she comes home from, from work and she's trying to, you know, enlighten some of the other RNs that she works with. And she was trying to explain to one of the uh, other nurses, you know, that desk has atoms in it, and they're not at rest. They're like in crazy, chaotic motion, especially the you know electron clouds of the atom. And if you could look at it at a deep enough level, you would see it's like you know chaos going on, and it's all kinds of motion happening, seemingly at random. And the other nurse, nurse goes, Barb, you're so crazy. <laughs> you know, uh, what, what I say to that is, how could you have made it to nursing school and not ever have under have even considered the concept of the atom. They don't teach it. Right. You know, and it's amazing. You know, she actually thinks the perceived stillness is actual stillness and didn't comprehend. If you zoom into that with a powerful enough microscope, you're going to see all kinds of motion and nothing's at rest. And she thought Barb was the weird one for trying to explain that to her. Okay, so there is no such thing as true rest. It doesn't exist. If, if something's in existence, it's in motion. Everything moves, everything vibrates, and at the most fundamental level, the universe and every single thing which comprises it is ultimately pure vibratory energy that is manifesting itself in different ways, different frequencies, different vibratory forms. The universe has no true 
solidity as such, as we imagine solidity at the macrocosmic level. Matter is merely energy in a state of vibration. And what this is, if we truly understand this, and many sciences are now finally really understanding this and try, trying to propagate this knowledge out into the public, we will, we will come to the understanding that this is a spiritual construct for experience to be gained, to have an experience and learn and grow in consciousness. That's what the purpose of this whole thing is for, you know? So nothing is truly solid, you know? It's, it's, a, it's again, like we say, we are spirit having a human experience. The whole universe is spiritual, having an a, a experience in solidity. All right, that's how you have to look at the principle of vibration. The principle of polarity states that everything has a dual nature to it. There are polarities in everything that exists, okay? Everything has poles, everything has its pair of opposites. However, opposites, they, they are identical in nature, but they're different in degree. So let me give you an example of what that means. Are hot and cold really opposites? Or can we simply look at them as the presence of heat energy or the absence of heat energy? Meaning that they're the same thing, energy. And whether it's concentrated in a specific area, which would make it hot, or whether it's absent from a specific area, which would make it cold, okay? That's what hot and cold are at the fundamental level. At our level of perception, they're opposites, but at the fundamental level, they're the same thing, energy or, it's, or lack thereof. Just like those three stages of the trivium. Are knowledge and ignorance the same thing? Yeah, actually they are. Because truth is always present. It's a matter of whether it's, pre whether it's taken in and processed or whether it's refused to be taken in and it's not processed. Okay? So it's, it's just like that. Uh, they're, they're, they're identical in their natures, but they're different in their degree. Okay? Extremes can meet and blend and you know, play with each other, like as depicted in the yin-yang symbol, masculine and feminine, they need to be blended. And at some level of reality, everything that is seemingly contradictory may be reconciled. Now again, I stress the term at some level. At the unified field level, this, everything is consciousness, pure consciousness. However, at this level, there are differences in consciousness. At this level, there are things that are taking place that we need to understand. At this level, there are things that we need to set right and rectify because it does matter. It does matter, okay? So, again, be careful with some of the new age-isms that get put out there. Yes, do it, can all paradoxes be reconciled? At some level. In this realm, we need to have our feet on the ground in the physical domain. You know, the con this is the concept in the, in the hermetic tradition, which is where a lot of this understanding derived from, out of ancient Egypt, what was known as Chem, the land called Chem, was what the actual uh, commissions referred to it as. Uh, the word Egypt is a bastardization of the capital, the Greek pronunciation of the capital city of Chem, which was Memphis at one point, and that city was referred to as Hygeptos in Greek. And that became Egypt in English. But the original name for Egypt was Chem. That's simply called black or dark in their language. It was the, the black land. And we get the word alchemy, which means, again, al, from. Okay? It means from the black land. al which is where alche alchemy comes from. And that means out of darkness, this knowledge will come and bring light. Because a lot of these mystery tradition teachings do come from Chem. And also, the people who took it from Chem and started to propagate it in other areas were the, the, um, uh, uh, the Greeks in the Greek mystery traditions. And again, there was light sides and dark sides to all these mystery traditions. Okay, There were some who used the knowledge wisely and tried to propagate it and tried to elevate human consciousness. And there were those who wanted to use it selfishly for their own benefit and to control others. So uh, my point was uh, that um, in, the, uh, in the Egyptian mystery tradition, um, they, um, uh, I, I lost my train of thought there, I'm sorry. Uh, I was talking about all, all paradoxes may be reconciled at some level. And uh, 
Uh, I brought up the mystery traditions. I can't remember why I went into, into that, so I'll just keep going. Um, let's look at the principle of rhythm. Everything flows out and in. Everything has its tides. All things rise and fall. Okay, so everything has a rhythm to it or a swing to it. There's tendencies that exist in energy. The pendulum swing manifests in everything that we undergo, everything that we perceive. The measure of the swing to the right is the measure of the swing to the left. It's just an opposite. It's perceived as an opposite. Rhythm will compensate. Now, what this, how this should be understood when we are talking about natural law is many people will say, well, that's just the way the tendency is moving us. It's just the way the tide is taking us, right? But that's not really accurate, okay? We can't look at these things as that the rhythms are set in stone and it has to be this way now, right? One of the things that a lot of the hermetic tradition taught regarding these laws, the, these principles, were they can be overcome by higher levels of consciousness, okay? This one was one of them. Rhythm is a principle that is a tendency for something to swing a certain way. It's, it's, let's, let's liken it to genetics. You know, if you look at some newer biology, a lot of modern biologists are suggesting consciousness plays into whether a gene activates or not and expresses a certain condition. Well, this is the same way. There's something that can be done about the swing or the tide, okay? Let's look at it as you have a boat. You want to row the boat out to sea, right? You have to get past the tide. You have to get past the breakers and the waves. And if that tide's really strong at high tide, it's going to be very much more difficult. You're going to have to expend more energy to get it out to sea. If, however, you were taking it when the current's moving out to sea, okay, there, there's a, a flow that's moving outward deeper into the ocean, and you start rowing that boat then, you're going to be able to do it much more easily. Okay, so if there's, if there's winds pushing along a plane, it's going to have to expend less energy. It's going to get there qu more quickly, okay, because it's adding to the energy. If, however, you're flying against the wind, you got to expend a lot more energy. It's just a tendency you can still get to where you want to go. You may just have to exert more effort. Right now, we're in a tendency of things are, are not flowing, okay? It's an ebb, all right? And it's something that needs to really have more energy put into it if we're going to resist the tendency. It doesn't mean nothing can be done about it. It doesn't mean it can't be overcome. It means at the time we're living in, okay, we want to make this motion go in this direction, but its tendency is to move in this direction. So more will is required at this time to move the consciousness. At other times, the consciousness may be flowing in a positive direction and it may take much less energy in order to move that consciousness forward. However, we're not living in that time. We are living at what many researchers have called the Kali Yuga or the age of darkness and destruction. You know, this is the, the point that resists the flow in consciousness the most. And it's going to take an enormity of effort to break down these pre-existing belief systems that don't serve who we are. So that's the principle of rhythm. This is the principle here in natural law that most fits in with how I'm using the term natural law today, cause and effect. Many people, again, in the New Age community, don't want to believe that there's causes and effects and that effects are driven by causes that, you know, come first and then manifest conditions. So the principle of cause and effect simply states that every cause has its effect and every effect has its cause. Uh, every single thing that occurs happens according to law, all right? Chance is a name for law, a law not recognized. There are many planes of causation, but nothing escapes the law. So again, is there free will? Yes, there is free will. But is there free will to ignore law without consequence? No, there is not. That's the limit of free will. Free will is operating within boundary conditions that I'm referring to as natural law. It's a series of laws, actually. Okay? Free will operates within these parameters or boundary conditions that cannot be exceeded or gone beyond without consequence 
Oh yeah, you can break natural law. Yes, you can break it. But you cannot break it without consequence. You cannot break it without consequence. Negative consequence. And that's why this body of knowledge has in the past been referred to as consequentialism. It is the knowledge of how consequences are generated by our free will decision-making processes within the boundaries of natural law. So this is the law of cause and effect, the principle of cause and effect. And I think this image, I was searching for images that encapsulate cause and effect, and I found this cartoon, and I think it does it brilliantly. Most of all, because will the effect happen immediately? No, it will not happen immediately. There is a time lag. You set the cause into motion, the universe is going to intelligently bring to you, through a rearrangement of all the dynamics that it needs to rearrange, the effect of what you've generated by setting that cause into motion. And there is a time gap between the, the cause going into place and the effect coming around and hitting you. This is why the pattern recognition of cause and effect is more difficult, because it is separated by a time lag, by what we perceive as linear time. Now, if you did a wrong to somebody, and immediately you were stung by a wasp, every single time you did a wrong to somebody, it showed up and bit you immediately within two seconds of you hurting somebody, stealing from somebody, lying to somebody, etc. Would you start to connect the stinging to the wrong that you did? I think most people would see the pattern. They would recognize the pattern. But since that doesn't happen, and there's a time lag to, gener to experiencing something harmful to ourselves once we do something harmful to other people, it's very difficult for people to see the, the connection through the time lag. Most, uh, and moreover, it doesn't exactly happen in a one-to-one -one ratio like this, okay? It's more, karmic consequence is more complicated than all of that, all right? What's happening is that all of us are experiencing in the aggregate the wrongs that the human species is conducting on a daily basis, which we do not attempt to rectify and stop through our inaction. Karma is being accrued. People think that karma can only be accrued from action. No, it cannot. It can be accrued from inaction as well. And that's where a, a, many people in our society is. They're not taking any action, and they're willing to let evil run unchecked. So this is ultimately going to come back and bite us. you know. And what we set into motion is going to actually topple over onto us if we don't change our thoughts, emotions, and behaviors. So nothing escapes law. We are bound by it eternally. You know, let me just go back. Go back. I'll leave it on, on this slide for a moment. You know, for some people familiar with my work, you've seen me break down the Matrix trilogy. And the law of cause and effect is brought forward extensively in the second Matrix movie, The Matrix Reloaded. And the, the scene that encapsulates this the most is the, the character of the Merovingian, who tells to the heroes who want to be free from the Matrix and its control, okay, you are coming to me without an understanding of why you are in this position. You don't understand the causal factors that have led to the current conditions that are in place. Therefore, you are coming to me with no power to affect change. You are powerless. So why should I help you? You're powerless because you lack knowledge and understanding of what set these events into motion. Why? The question why, he says, why is the only source of real power? Without why, you are powerless. He's talking about cause and effect, and he says it specifically. Causality, he calls the only real truth. And this is the villain. The words of truth come through one of the, it's a big technique in Hollywood too. The words of truth are spoken by the villain in the movie or in the series, okay? But if you listen and there is a twist, a dark twist to what he says. He says, free will is like an illusion. No, it is not. That's where the dark occultist is trying to trip up the heroes. There are both, free will and natural law. He tries to say free will 
the, the Morpheus character says to him, everything starts with choice. And Morpheus is correct. Our choices set that causality into motion before it becomes an effect. And the Merovingian tries to tell him, no, there is no free will. That's where the dark occultist will give you the bulk of truth and then poison it with that one thing he wants to get you to accept. Okay? So the, the next thing that needs to be understood is the two planes. All right? There's the plane of effects and then there's the plane of causes. No power to affect any change lies on the plane of effects, which is the physical manifested reality. Again, what already is, nothing can be done about. What already is, you cannot change. You cannot change the past. You can change what it is starting now and make sure that it gets changed in the future. But right now, what is, is the truth, and all you can do is accept that or reject it. You can't change the past. So the physical world that is manifested up to this point happened because of things that occurred in the past. The causes happened in the past. Nothing you can do about that right now. Okay? The plane of effects of the physical world is where manifested realities have already occurred, have already taken shape, have already formed due to their underlying causal factors. The plane of effects constitutes that which has already occurred. As such, no power to affect change lies here because that which has already occurred cannot unoccur. That which has occurred can't undo itself. It happened. It's already done. It has become that which is or truth. Human consciousness seems to be trapped upon the plane of effects, meaning that humanity as a whole remains ignorant of the underlying causes, causes which they themselves have set into motion and which lead to self-inflicted suffering in their lives. So if you're trapped at this level, what you're doing is you're looking at the symptoms and you're stuck looking at the symptoms. Okay, This is everybody oh, there's a political solution to this. We need to vote in the right people. Oh, there's a financial solution to this. We just need to set the right monetary policy. No, there's a scientific solution to this. And technological advancements are going to be made that suddenly save ourselves and make the world any different. And they think all of this is going to be done while slavery is still in place. Well, again, good luck with that. And let me know how it works out. Okay? I speak at free energy-related events. I work with the Tesla Science Foundation. I speak at MUFON-related events that talk about disclosure of extraterrestrial presence, okay? Both of these communities don't understand. The things that they say they want are impossible. And I'm going to start talking about them in, in this way more openly, you know, because I've kind of like uh, given them some soft teachings, and I think they need to hear it a little bit more harshly because both of these communities are not talking about morality, to the extent that they need to. They think, we're going to have free energy, but nothing's going to change as far as the social structure of the world goes. We'll just develop free energy, and that'll magically save us. We'll still have slavery, but free energy will be here, and the world will be a magically better place. The UFO community, they often think, oh, we're going to get this closure. They're going to come out and tell us everything they know about other intelligences that are out there in the galaxy and in the universe with us. Okay. And they think they're going to get that in a climate of slavery. Well, good luck with all those things. you got to take down the existing structure first. Okay? People think, oh, we got to build the new world while the old one decays. You have to destroy the existing power structure with the power of truth before anything new is going to grow here. Because this place is a garden full of weeds of poisoned ideologies and completely erroneous belief systems that have no bearing on truth whatsoever and cannot get us what we say we want. Until that those, those thoughts are changed, don't expect the results you want. So to the free energy movement, I say you're never going to get free energy in a climate of slavery. To the UFO community, I say you will never get disclosure in a climate of slavery. Slavery has to end first. Then you could get what you say you want. So, again, no power to affect any change lies in the world of effects. Cannot be done. You are rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic while it sinks. You're not creating any change doing those things. 
Because no, the underlying causes aren't changing. And the underlying causes are how we think, how we feel, and how we behave. And no one wants to look at that. They want to think all those things can stay in place and I can magically get what I want. I want to keep my hand over the fire, but I don't want it to burn and blister. Well, enjoy. See, find out what you get when you do that. Because that's what we're doing when it comes to natural law. So let's look at the plane of causality. This is the other plane. This is the mental realm, the mental world. Again, according to the law of mentalism, the first principle of natural law, Everything that manifests must first manifest in mind before it can manifest physically. So again, if the plane of causality is the mental world that's generating the causes in mind, okay, everything is happening there first, and then it is trickling down to the physical domain. It is manifesting in the physical domain only after it has manifested in the mental world. The plane of causality is where causes are set into motion prior to those causes manifesting as formed realities in the plane of effects. <clears throat> the, this plane of causality constitutes the causal factors, the why, which underlies and precedes all manifested things and events. All power, all power to effect change lies on this plane of reality. Human consciousness must move away from the plane of effects and to the plane of causality in order for human beings to understand the causal factors of the conditions which they are collectively manifesting in their lives. Only then will humanity be able to co-create their shared reality on a conscious level, meaning with an understanding of how natural law operates, rather than on, on an unconscious level meaning that we don't understand how natural law operates. And I just look at it in a simple graphic, in a simple you know, chart or graph. This is, the, this is the higher realm. This is the world of causality, the mental world, the why, the underlying causal factors, okay, that precede conditions which, which are manifested. This is where our consciousness has to go because this is where all power to affect change is at in the understanding of why that manifested to begin with. So these are the symptoms. This, this line could be looked at as the diagnosis. You have to make that diagnosis and get to the underlying causal factors that lead to the symptoms, okay? The plane of effects, on the other hand, meaning the physical world, is the manifested realm, that which has already occurred, that cannot be undone at least in the in the present moment, you could start in the present to undo it in the future. But as far as the present moment and all moments in the past go, you're not changing that. That's truth. That's what is. Okay? That's already manifested. You can't change it. No power to affect, to affect change lies in continuously analyzing the symptoms. you got to do that long enough that you know where the problem's at. You've made the diagnosis. Now you can get to the causal factors and start going to work changing those causes. Okay? Unfortunately, this plane, the plane of effect, seems to be where human consciousness in the aggregate is trapped. It can't seem to get past there. Even if it recognizes the problem, it wants to keep describing the problem. It wants to keep describing the prison. It doesn't want to look at the causal factors because it's afraid of what the causal factors are. It doesn't want to acknowledge the causal factors lie in how we think, feel, and act. And until those things are changed, the the external manifestation cannot change. That takes responsibility. The final principle of the um, seven principles of natural law, at least the, the formalized ones, are gender. Again, I'm going to talk about an eighth lost one. Gender exists in everything. Everything has its masculine and its feminine components or principles. We've already seen that when it comes to the human brain, consciousness, worldview, etc., Gender manifests on all planes of existence. Spiritual, mental, physical, everything. Okay? Very simple concept. What I want to briefly talk about is mental gender. Mental gender is the state of coexistence between the masculine and feminine aspects of the mind. Again, we've already looked at this. We looked at the breakdown of the physiology of the brain. At least of the higher order part of the brain, the neocortex. 
Our left brain hemisphere largely facilitates the masculine aspects of the mind or the intellect, logic, analytical thought, linear thought processes, while the right brain hemisphere largely facilitates the feminine aspect or intuition, meaning creativity, compassion, and holistic thought processes. This next section is what I call the lost principle. This is the eighth principle of natural law, which binds all of the other principles together. Okay, it is what I would call the encapsulating principle. Okay, it's the container inside which all the other principles fit very nicely and neatly. However, it's lost because we're not exercising it. See, we already looked at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven principles of natural law. And there they are represented by these circles overlapping each other. Okay? Can anybody see an eighth circle anywhere? You got it. Correct. Here's the eighth circle. And this might look familiar. You might have seen this somewhere. Okay? This, this pattern is called something. Does anybody know what this pattern is called? What is it? Not the flower of life. The seed of life. The seed of life. Okay? Now, what happens from a seed? It grows. It generates something. It creates something. A seed has an outer casing, an outer shell. Okay? Then if you're going to get to the inner core of it that contains all of the creative, genetic, generative material, okay, that shell has to be there and intact. You break the shell of the seed, the creative essence of the seed is going to be gone. Okay? Now, what is that principle? Here's what that principle is. It's the eighth or what I call the lost principle. And it's the thing that has to be present in order for any change to manifest itself. And it is not what most people think of it as. Even when I tell you what this is, I guarantee you there will be an inaccurate connotative meaning for what people think this means, okay? Here's what the eighth principle is. It is known as the generative principle, or the principle which governs creation, which actually is the causal factor that goes into effect and generates the result that we say that we want. But what's the real term for it? Who can guess what the actual term, what the generative principle of creation actually is? No, it is not action. It, okay, now most people will say it's love. I want to distinguish it from the concept of love, even as I'm going to describe love in this presentation a little bit later on. Okay? What is it? Procreation. No? What? Somebody said it. But somebody said something else. No? Care. Who? Care. Care. There it is. Okay? The generative principle is care. Now, this is different than compassion. People say, why don't you use the word compassion? Because that's not what I'm talking about. It is a different concept than compassion or even what I would describe as love. Care, and I mean care with a capital C, and here I didn't even put it with a capital C. I'm just putting it in all uppercase. All uppercase care. D distinguish this from care with a lowercase c. Okay? This means... What are you giving attention and helping to grow? What are you focusing upon? Because what focus you're focusing upon, that's what's ultimately getting generated, getting created, and growing. And this doesn't mean be ignorant of what's going on in the world and don't look at anything that's negative because you're going to feed that and give power to it. That's not what it means. Okay? That means you know what you're feeding? In that instance, if you want to do that, you're feeding ignorance. And that's what's going to grow. It's the exact opposite that the New Agers want you to believe that it is. By ignoring the negative, you are ensuring that more of it occurs. You are fueling it by ignorance. Ensuring that it grows and takes over. Okay? What care has to be looked at here as is... This is what you're giving your energy to. This is what you're focused upon. 
This is what you actually care enough about to do, to spend your time on, to put your attention on, to manifest in the world. That's what I'm talking about as care, okay? That's what generates our experience in the aggregate. Most people don't care about what's really happening. Therefore, it is an impossibility for us in the aggregate to change the direction of energy, to change the direction of consciousness, and ultimately to get what we say we want. That's how the real law of attraction works, all right? Here's how it actually operates. The loss principle is the dynamic of care. What we care about on a day-to-day -day basis acts as the driving force of our thoughts and actions. What did I say we need to develop? The heart, mind, guts, right? Heart, mind, guts, in that order. Care comes first. You gotta care enough to know, to develop the knowledge, okay? Then you gotta act on it and put it into practice. Apply it. So that's the order. Heart, mind, guts. Care, knowledge, action. Those are the steps, okay? And all three of those have to be in place. All three. That's what unity consciousness is. It's unifying thoughts, emotions, and actions. The three aspects of consciousness, such that there is no contradiction between them. Our thoughts, what we say, what, what we think, how we feel, and how we act are one and the same. There's no contradiction. That's unity consciousness, okay? Therefore, Okay, since it's the, care is the driver of our thoughts and actions, it ul ultimately can be seen as the generator of the quality of our shared experience here on the earth. Care is what generates the whole thing. Hence, it has been called the generative principle. Liken the heart to a pump in the body. Well, what does a pump do? It's a generator. It provides energy. It moves the life force through the blood in the body. In every ancient tradition, they talk about the life force being in the blood. The heart is what pumps that through the whole physiology and enables us to continue to sustain life, okay? The heart is the generator, it's the pump. It's the center of the being. As important as the brain is, which we just talked about the importance of it, the heart is ultimately what's generating the experience because what we care about determines what we think about on a daily basis most of the time and therefore how we behave, all right? So the, this principle has often been referred to as the generative principle. Uh, is anybody familiar with the compasses and square symbol of Freemasonry with the G in the middle? Well, that's what the G stands for at the highest level. They'll talk about many, many porch masons. These are the exoteric masons that are given the teachings of the profane and they think they're in the know, okay? They're given the, the information, well, this only means geometry, it only means God, etc. okay? One of the things they'll tell you it means in, at a slightly higher level is that it means gnosis, knowledge, okay? Which we saw the meaning of in Greek earlier. At a higher level, at illuminated levels of Freemasonry, which are above 30, 32nd degree, they will give you what the real meaning of the G inside the compasses and square is. And it is the generative principle. It means genesis, creation, okay? And yeah, you can tie that right back to God. I'm not saying those things are different. And the, the forms that get created in the physical manifested world are geometric forms. So it is geometry as well, it's all these things. But at the highest level, it's the generative principle. That's what that G really stands for in esoteric Freemasonry, okay? It's called the generative principle because that means to create. It comes from, the word generative comes from Latin. The verb genere, as we've already talked about, means to create. The generative principle is what we create through. And it's lost because people don't care. They don't have care. Hence, it's the lost principle, okay? Here's how it works, folks. What we care enough to put our will behind, okay? So again, heart, mind, guts. Guts is the will. 
the action, the masculine principle. That's what gets, gets things done ultimately in the physical domain. What we care enough to put our will behind, and that's driven by the care. That's the generator or the pump that drives the will, okay? What we care enough to put our will behind is ultimately what gets created or manifested in our world. The world is the way that it is because most people do not care enough, even if they say, they pay lip service, okay, and say that they want things to be different. They don't care enough to actually change it through their actions. Because when, it, again, when it comes all down to it, and I said this in my New Age, uh, you know, uh, BS seminar or, or lecture, okay? What it comes down to is preventing action. Preventing action. That's what the New Age community is designed to do. They want people inactive because the dark occultists know that the thing that is ultimately generating our reality is behavior, as you saw in that simple four-part chart, that little you know building block chart that I put up there. Action is what's generating the reality. That gets generated through what we care about because our cares and our desires drive our actions. Okay, so most people will say they want things to change, but then when you say, what are you doing to make that change happen? <laughs> Not a word, silence comes back on the other end, okay? So they don't care enough to change it through their actions. That's what the generative or lost principle is about. And until that principle is regained and people get out of their laziness and most of all get out of their cowardice. Again, in that New Age lecture, I'm talking about what it ultimately comes down to in the New Age movement, and I'll look at any New Ager in the eyes. They're cowards. Cowards. Ultimately, they know the evil that we're up against, and they intend to do not a damn thing about it. That's what it really, that's what it really comes down to. And anybody telling you it's different than that is lying to you. Okay? They're cowards. Period. And I'll say it right to any of their faces. Anything I say up here, I'll, anybody that believes in that nonsense, come and bring them to me. I'll tell them right to their face. Straight and open, just like I said it here. Because I don't care. I don't care about their nonsense. I care about what's real. Okay? So, I'm telling you, this religion has to go. It's got to go. If people are going to make real change happen, the idea that it can't be done uh, that it can be done without taking actual real-world action has to be purged from human consciousness. Reality does not work like that, period, the end. I, and I can't make you accept that. I recognize I can't make anybody in this room accept that. All I can do is put it out there for your consideration, and if you have some common sense and really, really think about it, you'll understand what I'm saying here is absolutely the way it is. Okay? Many people want to deceive you through these religious notions, okay, which is all about getting people to stand down and accept their chains. That's what that religion's in place for. All right? This next section I call spiritual currency or spiritual currencies. All right? There's two spiritual currencies, time and attention. Now, look, we can readily see this, right? Time is money, people say. It's currency, right? What am I going to spend my time on? What am I going to pay attention to? Pay attention. You pay for something, you get something in return when you pay for something, right? That's what attention will get you here. It will get you something in return. You pay attention, you're going to come out of here with a lot of understanding. There's two spiritual currencies, time and attention. This analogy can be very readily, can be seen very readily in the saying, spending time and paying attention. Whatever information or endeavors we put our time and attention toward, we end up getting something in return for that investment of these currencies. This is what real money is, folks. Real money. This will get you real money. One eye, moan eye. Okay? If you want real money instead of the fake Federal Reserve nonsense fiat paper currency money that isn't worth the paper it's printed upon, then keep thinking that that has value. Okay? And people who say gold is value, gold is real money. Yeah, well, I ask people, what intrinsic value does gold have? And they say, well, oh, it's been traded with throughout time immemorial. People valued it all, all time. Does that make it intrinsic? You answered my question. It's like saying, 
why, why does that projector have intrinsic value? And you say, because I find it valuable. No, that projector has intrinsic value because it's capable of projecting an image. And if I want that task done, that's what I use a projector for. Okay? Well, what's gold used for? Can you build clothing out of it? Can you build a house out of it? Is it malleable enough to be uh, molded into a weapon of some sort? You going to take shelter under it? Well, maybe if you have enough of it. <laughs> hey, you know, the whole point is there is no intrinsic value to this. It's something that's bi the idea of it having in of any precious metal having intrinsic value, other than you know, okay, in a technological society, it's used for computers. This is true, okay. But I'm talking about in nature. You know, where would this idea of intrinsic value of gold come from in the ancient past? People say, well, it's used as a medium of exchange, okay? It, money is not a medium of exchange. People think of it as a medium of exchange, and it's not. It's, it's incorrect, okay? Money is the limiter of energy in the system. See, people think of money as currency. Even the name is a mind control technique because it's supposed to be about, it's the current in the energy system. This is the current it's the amperage, right? No, it's not. It's, it's not the capacitance either. It's not a store. That's another thing people will tell you money is, what they say is real money. Okay? It's all fake. It's all fake. It's not a store either. You know what it is? It's the resistance in the system. It's the resistance to change in the system. It acts as the resistor. Because as long as that modality of slavery called money continues to exist, there will always, it will always be extraordinarily difficult to create real lasting change. So again, again, I, I piss off everybody. <laughs> Religion's gotta go, scientism's gotta go, new age thoughts gotta go, money's gotta go. All of it's gotta go. You know why? It's all religion. It's all religion, and the word religion means to hold one back to tie one up and keep them where they're at, as we're going to get to in a few moments. Okay? So let's get back to spiritual currencies. We end up getting something in return on what we put our investment of spiritual currencies toward. And you know what that, if it's put toward the right goals, the end result is true money, one eye. Okay? True spiritual vision, the ability to see, to unoccult something and see it for what it really is. That's what comes from truly putting time and attention onto the right things. This return could come in the form of knowledge. It could come in the form of understanding. It could come in the form of skills, expertise, and, and empowerment. But only if we invest these two spiritual currencies wisely. And let me tell you something, folks. That's what, why most people don't have any money. They got nothing to pay for it with. See, you, you pay attention and you get money. You spend time, and you get money. I'm talking about the real thing. Cool. We're going to take a break in about five to ten minutes. Okay? So we have to invest our spiritual currencies wisely. We should seek to improve our quality of attention by placing it upon information that is capable of improving both ourselves and the human condition as a whole. G give me a heads up in about eight or nine minutes. Thank you. Such an effort would also constitute a valuable investment of our time. We should ask ourselves, what am I spending my time on? What am I spending my time doing? And what am I paying attention to? That's where you will find whether you're investing in real value, something that is truly valuable. If most of the time we're spending our time on nonsense and trivialities, and, you know, divisive things and TV and sports and all other kinds of entertainment and distraction, well, you're going to have a return on that investment, and that return is going to be low. It's not going to result in much money, real money, okay? Most importantly, we need to ask ourselves, what kind of quality am I getting in return for my investments of time and money, a time and, and attention, I'm sorry, Okay? These are the spiritual currencies, and that's what most people don't want to give. They don't want to give these freely for a return on investment. They don't want to pay attention to the right things. They don't want to spend time on the right things. This is a simple chart of how our quality of our attention, okay, and again, this is in the aggregate, but it's created by all the individuals, how the quality of our overall attention as a species will affect 
our world in accordance with the principle of correspondence, which states, as goes the microcosm or the microcosmic units, so will become the macrocosm. Okay? So over here, we have a pure information stream. This is good information. This is information that is capable, that resonates with truth, and is capable of helping to develop wisdom or right action within the being. This over here is the poisoned information stream like we get from the mainstream media, from scientism, from the New Age movement, from uh, government indoctrination centers called schools. Okay, This is the poisoned information stream. Now, everybody's going to take in some form of a mixture of both of these streams. What the goal needs to be is to purify. Just like, hey, you take in bad food, you're going to have bad health. You take in bad information, the output through behavior is going to be bad. So you got to purify. Meaning, if there's valves here on the individual buckets, these are called the individual people, okay? And they're all coming together with the quality of their water, right? What they're holding within their consciousness. And that's all going into the big pool called the world. Everybody's bringing their bucket to the pool, they're pouring it in, and then they're jumping in. And that's the world. That's the quality of the world, right? The quality of this whole thing here is going to be based on how much poisoned, polluted information was in your bucket compared to how much pure information was in your bucket. Okay? So there's valves over here. We've got to shut this one off, this brown muddied valve, muddy valve over here, and we've got to open this one up. Okay? If we do that, the world will be purified and it, we won't be creating self-inflicted suffering. We don't do that, we're going to be swimming in brown muck, okay? And generating all kinds of problems for ourselves. So, how are we spending our time? What are we paying attention to? Is this what we're doing with our time and attention? Sitting behind the hypnosis box? Which means suppression of knowledge. Hypnosis is the suppression of knowledge or the suppression of spirit, okay? Or are we going to devote our time to some pursuits of wisdom, which means developing knowledge, converting it to understanding by process it, processing it accurately, and then converting it into wisdom through action, through right action. And, you know, you got to read to do this. People don't want to hear that either. Okay? Reading is required. The ancient Romans had two words, the same word. Okay? They meant two different things in their language. The word was liber, L-I-B-E-R. Liber meant free, as in not a slave. A free being would be described as liber, free. It's the basis of the English word liberty, 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 freedom. Okay? They had the same word also meant a different concept. So the word liber didn't just mean free. If it was used in a different context, does anybody know what else the word liber meant, L-I-B-E-R, meant in Latin? Book. It meant book. Does that tell us something? They associated the word, the Latin word for book also meant free in their language. Okay? And again, liber is the basis for the word library. Okay? Liberary. Okay? Where you can go to become free if you read the right books. You know? And again, the world is our library now. You know, we've reunited all the parts of the big library that were cast to the four corners of the earth. The mystery traditions are available at your fingertips now, which hasn't been the case at any time in human history. And what are we doing? We're playing Farmville on Facebook. You know? So we have to ask ourselves, what are we spending our spiritual currency on? And are we investing it wisely for a return of real money, which is actually spiritual enlightenment? I'm going to uh, take a quick break right there, and we'll pick it up with the next section in 10 minutes. 10 minutes, right back here to continue. Thank you.